try to uh, look at the to present a, a, maybe an introduction to using genomic ranges and some use cases that I've been encountered. Um, and since I discovered this uh, very efficient data structure for uh, for finding uh, essentially uh, managing genomic ranges in in R. Um, so to understand the, the problem here, as you know, in bioinformatics, we, we have to refer to the various features of the genome and genes and transcripts are usually the ones that, that are interested, we are interested in it, and how they are located, where they are located on the chromosome sequence. Uh, these are usually referred to as the annotation of the genome which uh, consists basically basically on of start and stop coordinate of each feature on the chromosome. And these are the genomic ranges that, uh, that are uh, handled by, by this uh, powerful data structure in R. Uh, these features are also grouped uh, together in, a, in, in a hierarchy. Uh, uh, genes can have multiple transcripts. Uh, transcripts can have uh, multiple exons and so on. The common representation and uh, ex exchange format uh, is like GTF, uh, gene transfer format uh, text files, or GFF, which is a new iteration. And uh, to understand how the G genome you know, and G ranges uh, class maps to onto this annotation of file formats, uh, we can look at the the typical tracks in a, in a GTF. We have the chromosome on the first column, then what's called a, like a track sometimes or a source for the for the annotation in the second column. And um, then the feature type is the third and so on. So these are tab delimited columns and the ninth column actually has a, a, a flexible uh, number of attributes associated with the uh, with this annotation. Some of them are mandatory, like transcript ID and gene ID. Um, and many of them are, uh, the rest are optional. But usually the gene symbols are also there found in, for ensemble and uh, gene code annotation, they are like gene name, uh, gene underscore name uh, attribute in the ninth column. And the problem becomes very complex when we want to find all the overlaps between uh, this kind of genomic ranges. When we, when we put, when we had the uh, RNA seq to read alignments, for example, there are spliced alignments, can be hundreds of uh, millions uh, on, a, on at the same time in a, in a, on the genome. So when you want to do any kind of uh, interval query, like to, to find, to, what uh, what are all the overlaps, for example, to enumerate all the overlaps between uh, your read uh, alignments and and uh, a gene annotation, the uh, reference annotation, you you need some efficient algorithm and data structures. Um, I noticed that uh, in in other pro programs, uh, in other languages, you you don't have the luxury to have this kind of specialized data structures for, I mean, you have to find some libraries like, um, I think for example, in C++, I had to pretty much write this from scratch um, in order to like an interval tree, it's, it's called a data structure that could efficiently help me find um, gene uh, well, overlaps between uh, large sets of uh, genomic features. But um, in, uh, in R and Bioconductor, we have this G ranges class from the genomic ranges package, which is a feature rich data structure with very efficient methods for finding overlaps between genomic ranges and many more convenient operators, uh, operations that are defined for this uh, genomic ranges and uh, ranges like intersections and uh, you know subtracting ranges one from the other one set from another set. So uh, all vectorized and most of the operations are very well vectorized and very efficient to, to be to perform a very large uh, collections of, of genomic ranges of intervals. This uh, the genomic ranges uh, genomic ranges package was added in I think in 2010 to uh, 
uh, to buy a conductor, it was a very big deal because it allowed this kind of uh, mass processing of uh, of a line. Mm -hmm. Now the al uh, algorithmic efficiency of this range interval operation in G ranges comes from the base I ranges package. Package that uh, that G ranges class is built around that. So uh, the I ranges, which is imagined integer ranges, um, the classes this I ranges base class is capable of managing a large set of inter intervals, just integer ranges. And uh, this is implemented using a nested containment list data structure instead of an interval tree. I noticed that, um, which is designed for efficiently solving the interval overlap query problem. Uh, so, namely, this is done by prearranging the set of integer ranges in such a way that uh, retrieving all the possible overlaps for a query range is very efficient. Now, I ranges based class is also providing methods for querying, intersecting, uh, merging, reducing intervals, and as uh, as we will see. But the G ranges class maintains essentially an I ranges object for each chromosome. So basically, we could say that the G ranges class is a annotated set of I ranges objects, one per chromosome. Um, a sequence, uh, there are some accessor methods like we see this. That's how this, it's a composite data structures, which is essentially the, what we see in the summarized experiments as a row ranges um, side. Um, so se sequence names are uh, the chromosome names. The first column the, is a, on the left here, we see the data structure that's responsible just for the ranges per chromosome and the strand added to the I ranges class. And we can have uh, a limited, uh, well, uh, all uh, very flexible uh, metadata associated with each of these uh, chromosome ranges. And again, they are strand oriented unless you use the uh, common notation of star uh, character to, to uh, denote unstranded features. And in general, you have plus and forward reverse and yeah, you can also uh, put features with, uh, uh, with no strand. Um, so now another important concept added by uh, by this uh, genomic ranges package is a G ranges list, which is a, a kind of a mouthful because uh, thinking that G ranges itself is a list, so a list of genomic intervals, right? Uh, but G ranges list allows grouping of G ranges uh, by common features uh, and found usually in metadata. For example, you can group all exons by transcript ID or even by gene ID. Uh, and so it will mimic the hierarchical structure of uh, some of the genomic features. And we'll see how this can be used. Uh, they implement a lot of accessor methods for that operates on G, G ranges list in a way that uh, takes into account the uh, the sub features, the G, G ranges for each of the element in the list. So you can do transcript versus transcript uh, alignment, uh, overlap, get the overlaps, uh, and uh, you know even compute uh, exon overlap uh, size and, uh, and other operations, how many junctions are in common. And uh, uh, it's very useful. It was very useful in my work for uh, is uh, having to deal with annotation of, of uh, novel transcripts. Ironically, in order to create a G ranges list, uh, you have to actually use a split uh, command as shown in this example. So the split method, uh, which is essentially, yes, yeah, splits the whole uh, G ranges uh, by a specific feature, um, in this case, transcript ID in this example. So. Now the, the easiest way to get from the to the annotation uh, load the information from the annotation uh, into a G ranges uh, data structure um, object. I found that the R track layer uh, package offers a very convenient import a function that can even import directly the compressed GTFs that we can download usually from 
uh, Jen Code or Ensemble. And yeah, I'll, I'll show some code later, but uh, basically, yeah, you can get, you can use the, the metadata part of the, of the, um, of this G range, this object is like a, a data frame. We may know uh, some of it from the raw data um, of a summarized experiment. So you can use the columns in metadata to, to even you know perform some data frame like selections, uh, subsetting of the of the G ranges in this collection. I uh, I think we. Well, yeah, it, of course, one of the uh, workhorses of the of the G range is uh, the genome, genomic ranges uh, packages, the find overlaps and count overlaps uh, methods, which are doing exactly what I was uh, describing earlier, finding uh, very efficiently handling this, uh, finding all the overlaps uh, between uh, two large sets of genomic ranges. Um, and in this case, that's the return the return of uh, this uh, find overlap function, which has many options, we can find all the overlaps. We can find exact overlaps between start and end. We can find we can find containment contained overlaps like we read, um, or exact overlaps by either end, just matching the start or matching the end. So uh, the return of this function result is the this hits uh, object structure, which has a simple list of uh, indices in each of the query ranges or uh, G ranges or subject G ranges. Um, and they show how each of the query, uh, the, in, the queries ranges on the, on the left column, the first mm -hmm. column map to the uh, subject uh, G ranges in the second column. And this is a way to, that we can use to for simple uh, annotation, we can like transfer. If you have the uh, query ranges are some unknown uh, genomic ranges, and the subject hits are um, subject G ranges are uh, reference annotation. You can transfer, for example, uh, G names or G symbols uh, to annotate to create this uh, metadata column in the query G ranges by using a uh, an assignment like the one below um, using this query hits uh, sensors to get essentially just the column or the first column of the all the indices in the first column of this hits object and you can assign a new like g name in this case we could be called annotation with the g name uh, from the subject g range is matching so in order to, to find the matching you should use <laughs> Essentially, query, query hits on the left side and subject hits on the right side. We'll see this say, in some example code. Um, getting the exonic, I mean, there's usually there are some use cases that I that I uh, dealt with were getting the exonic length of all transcripts and genes in gen code, which is not uh, directly available. So I see it is. Uh, Okay, yeah, sorry, um, I realized that uh, I, I showed the function earlier that, uh, um, yeah, somebody asked, uh, there's an OI function. I'm gonna uh, show it actually later. Uh, there's a custom function that I use to get the object information. Um, anyway, so uh, to resume, uh, example use cases here are getting the exonic length uh, of these uh, composite features or getting, uh, the set of known introns. I mean, in this case, I, I usually want to get a, a better set of um, annotated introns from the gene code annotation, which only provides uh, uh, axonic features by default. So I have to, in order to annotate uh, novel junctions, I, I uh, usually, I mean, we usually build this uh, set of known introns from the reference annotation. And um, also, there are situations where you have this novel set of genomic features, like introns, X and exon junctions, or transcripts, and we want to know what genes are uh, being overlapped uh, by this uh, in the, from the reference annotation by these novel features. 
And there is finally the possibility to also write with using the R SAM tools uh, package. You can write the uh, actual sequence data, uh, sequence uh, FASTA files with the actual sequences for players. Uh, uh, other use cases, like if you want the intergenic sequences, like for example, for a salmon a decoy a file where they want to check if the breeds map better in intergenic uh, regions than the actual introns, uh, you can pull those uh, separately in a file and use that for various analysis, the intergenic sequence. And, um, the same is another use, quite common use case, is to write transcript on FASTA files, which is basically all the transcript sequences, uh, splicing the exons and put them in a FASTA file and use for analysis like uh, uh, pseudo alignment with a uh, salmon or uh, Callisto quantification, essentially transcript quantif quantification. Okay. Now I would uh, yeah I'd go to the code, but uh, I realized it was so much to cover that. Uh, Probably it's probably hard to follow along, uh, but I, the code is on the GitHub repository, and, and you can see a lot of other information there, like uh, even the custom function that I mentioned. Or I uh, will we, we'll, we'll see it later being used, but uh, it's all on the GitHub repository. But here there are quite a few tricks that I'm trying to use uh, to download the example files. Uh, well, I guess this shouldn't take more than uh, a couple of minutes for some of the files are downloaded. Actually, I have this at check. So in my case, it's not going to take long at all. I'm checking if they're already available. I don't need to download again. But uh, there are some examples file like even a genomic, the main chromosome of HG38, which I use for some example, but being uh, compressed, uh, it's not a problem. Um, it doesn't take that long. But the, the ex, ex, example of using the R track layer import to get the G ranges uh, can be seen here. Like uh, yeah, I'm uh, downloading, I'm, I'm, as I'm downloading and importing, because importing takes a long time. Um, it can be 20 seconds on a, on a, on a fast machine, but, uh, oh, on a, it can take even longer to actually import. So in this case, I uh, I imported it and I save it immediately as uh, using the QS format, which is with QSave, uh, which is um, a faster way to get our, our data uh, instead of our data to save uh, our objects. And I found this um, more convenient. I have some raw uh, rough estimates there in, in commented out with how long each operation operation takes. This is not directly to, related to uh, genomic ranges, but uh, I don't. I just found that it was useful to to see what's in there. Now, uh, the OI function uh, function that I, I mentioned is to inspect and get the memory usage of each uh, of the object. In this case, we just loaded the, the GTF in um, in our um, data, and even though it takes a while to gather the memory information because there are a lot of lists and uh, pointers there. Um, it also shows the type of the, so this is a G ranges class S4 of uh, the length uh, of 3 million. Now, what does this 3 million, uh, the 3 million features? Uh, it loads all the features. Uh, uh, it's too much to doesn't fit the metadata takes so long. Uh, but the features here are all the exons, gene transcripts. Actually, I have this table here to see the feature types. And there are like, some of them are very well uh, obvious, like gene transcript, exon, CDS. Um, the others are essentially included in the exon uh, features. So uh, from, from the point of view of uh, genomic ranges, Basically, we can just look uh, at gene transcripts and exon features and CBS if, if we want to look in, uh, you know, for a coding sequence information. But start codon and stop codon are uh, essentially included, are just point features annotated on the exon and CDS. And UTRs are also subsets, uh, sub ranges of exons. Uh, 
And there is also the selenoprotein modification of the stop codon, which is uh, the selenocysteine uh, uh, feature here, which is annotated on, on some axons or some uh, of the transcripts. So these are uh, yeah, the different classes of features that are available in this gene code. I think what I loaded here was uh, gene code 43, I think one of the latest, if not the latest. So just the main chromosome. So it was much faster than doing importing because I used the, again, the prepared the file as a, saved as a QS. So this is a trick too that I, I like to use sometimes to not have to reload the whole, to import the whole file, to parsing, parsing being slow, right? Out of the text file there. Now, to get the exonic length for, for the transcripts, uh, we, we sh we, I can show here that um, we can separate from this, since in this file, the annotation data that I, I loaded has all the features, we can make a subset of, of uh, G, G ranges or just the transcripts. And in this case, I also assign the names because these are unique. I can assign a names for each G ranges object. Uh, to be the transcript ID, which makes sense when you have a, a subset of uh, just the transcript ranges. And then um, I also prepare a, an exon uh, genomic ranges, a set of uh, genomic ranges with just the exons. And here I show that how, as I mentioned earlier, the split function, a split method for gen genomic ranges creates a G, G ranges list uh, we're grouping the exons essentially by uh, by transcript ID in this case in this call. Um, and now here is a uh, this G G, uh, G ranges list is a uh, is a list essentially it can be traversed as a list. You can use l apply functions and you know, apply functions in general to to go through all the uh, subsets of. Uh, Group exons grouped exon G ranges grouped by X by transcript ID, but this would be very slow. And actually, there is something uh, interesting about the way G ranges list uses all sorts of compressed uh, in, in ranges and uh, around length encoding. That actually using the L apply function is very slow. So you should try to use. Uh, vectorized functions that are methods that are de defined in the genomic range, uh, genomic ranges package to operate directly on, on uh, G ranges or G, G ranges list uh, objects, which is in this case, we have this with function that actually recognizes the G ranges list, list um, object and it performs the, it gets returns the exonic length for each transcript. Uh, so this is a lot of things are happening before the uh, behind the scenes there, right? Because with is a function also the base uh, with a method is from coming from I, I ranges from the just a simple integer range, and normally you can get the length of an interval of a genomic range using with, uh, but uh, in this case it goes uh, into the each of G ranges in the G ranges list. And gets the the width the width and returns actually a, a named list of exonic length where the name of this uh, of this list names in this list are actually the transcript IDs. So this is an interesting property that can be exploited here to get much faster than if you would get using L apply or something like that, because now you can also sum uh, apply a sum for each of these uh, exonic length by transcript ID. So if you look at this uh, code, so if you just look at the TX lens uh, output, which is the length of each, essentially it will have the length of each transcript in, in, in this uh, output of, of the sum function here. So, well, yeah, I'm doing uh, <laughs> much more stuff, but the head, uh, yeah, you can see there's just a named list uh, from, from the TX, TX length. It's just a named list where you can get all the, all the 
length, exonic length of each task because it's some essentially yeah, it's some the the for each task it's some uh, all the exon intervals length of the width of each exon interval. So um, this is what we usually do for normalization. We need for these ex, uh, features we need the length parameter uh, in order to normalize and uh, keep track of keep track of the length of the feature. And I know that in for transcript data, for example, we don't really have that in our range uh, summarized experiments. So we can, we can compute it by using calculating using this kind of uh, procedure. Um, now we also in a similar way we can use the length function to uh, which is vectorized over the the G ranges list that I built earlier for each transcript grouping exons, we can get the uh, number of exons for each uh, for each transcript and assign it as a you see at length and num exon here are just new metadata columns that I'm adding to these G ranges objects, which is NNA uh, and TXGR. I know it's, uh, the variable names are not very uh, explanatory here. I tend to use very short variable names. So interestingly enough, if you look at something like uh, this one here, uh, you can see that sorting by number of exons, it's actually something interesting to, uh, to investigate sometimes to see, of course, to check for correctness. And, uh, but in this case, um, where is the num length? No, exons, okay, yeah. The largest, uh, the largest number of exons for a transcript is 363, which seems unbelievable. Is uh, I think the TTN uh, gene uh, should be here somewhere in the metadata. A titan or something. I'm not sure exactly how it's pronounced. Gene name right there. Yeah, yeah the, uh, I can see the. <laughs> what did this type correspond? Yeah, I don't know why I don't see it right now. Uh, maybe there's an alternate name. I remember looking it up to make sure that this transcript is actually like that 363 exons, which is huge. Um, but somehow it doesn't it doesn't match what I what I looked at earlier. Is a long non coding RNA? Okay, I can double check this. Uh, I remember looking it up and being tight in gene. Yeah. Now, um, in order to get the exons, and uh, there was another interesting trick that I found. The easiest way to get the exons for each transcript it was to actually subtract uh, exon ranges from the transcript uh, ranges, which is again a, a, an interesting operation that comes. Uh, Back from comes uh, from the base class I ranges and it was uh, made so it works on G, G ranges list and G ranges so you can just uh, first you, if you group the the exons and of course we only care about multi exon uh, transcripts so we we get this uh, in this code I get this um, genome genome gene G ranges list. Uh, that only for the multi exon transcripts, and then essentially I subtract uh, the list, the inter, the from each interval with this operation P set diff here. Uh, I subtract the all the exon ranges from each transcript uh, range. So by doing that, you get the introns, which is uh, um, sounds uh, interesting. The result is is initially just a in list of, um, is a G ranges list actually, the initial results. So in order to get the G ranges, because I needed to annotate uh, each of the end introns with what genes are they part of and what uh, what uh, transcripts also uh, share that uh, junction, that intron, I, I had to unlist them and then do a lot of <laughs> processing here trying to, 
to get this information and to save. That's another thing that I, I was gonna do. Since the processing takes a while to, to gather all the genes uh, that um, share that intron, uh, which has happened sometimes. I thought it wasn't usually transcripts share intron. Some transcripts can share intron, but I also found situation that even uh, multiple genes uh, can can share introns. Uh, so in order to get this as least associated with it, uh, with it, uh, least metadata columns uh, for each uh, transcript in this G ranges object for each junction. Sorry, uh, which is I'm calling it annotation junction data. Um, I'm also saving it because I, I try to to. I try to find better ways to uh, to create these metadata columns uh, without uh, resorting to L apply, which, as I said, is very slow on on G ranges, on and G ranges uh, list. So uh, I resorted to actually some tricks using data table, which has very good aggregation capabilities. So this this code has nothing directly to do with G ranges, because I'm completing essentially the introns uh, G ranges uh, to a data table in order to do this complex, <laughs> so it's, yeah, it looks ugly, uh, complex uh, aggregation uh, of uh, fields. Like for example, G names, of course, they're gonna be repeated, so I have to, uh, to, to make them unique and then also sort them because there are situations when I want to compare gene lists uh, for, for uh, different junctions and they, they have, in order to, to compare properly uh, two gene lists, uh, they have to be in the same order, uh, the, the gene names in order to make sure. So that's why I also use sort in these lists to build this list. So this is a very uh, powerful aggregation, um, uh, creating multiple uh, columns, uh, aggregating columns using data table, uh, <laughs> which is indeed uh, hard to follow, but yeah, it takes, uh, I, I, I guess I said that some, yeah, I can take questions or, or um, yeah, we can look at the code and see how, how this results in a, in a very well annotated uh, junctions data G ranges object because then after I get, I use uh, this aggregation, I use the information from the data table that, that I aggregated this way to populate this uh, uh, metadata, met columns from, from the G ranges junction data in the end. Which uh, I think uh, just to see the, the new columns that I added with the aggregated information, those are, um, yeah, the gene symbols in most cases is just one, uh, one gene symbol, right? And one gene ID, but uh, in many cases, um, in some cases, not many, sorry. Uh, you, as I said, there are actually cases where the introns are shared by multiple uh, gene symbols. And of course, gene count is also, I, 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 I save it here, and the transcript count sharing, the transcripts sharing this uh, intron. So this is a complex annotation of these junctions, but these are actually the junctions from the reference. But this information has to be pulled uh, from the reference annotation, right? But the information is not readily available just in the GTF file by looking at it. So in this case, I prepare this annotation junction data G ranges object with all these metadata columns uh, that are gonna be used uh, later to annotate novel junctions, which is uh, happening also in, uh, just to, in the speakeasy uh, pipeline, there is also part of the code when it creates the uh, junction, uh, RNCs that actually performs a similar uh, function, um, which what I'm describing here, annotating novel junctions using this kind of list of introns uh, prepared in advance with the from the reference annotation. So <laughs> it's a convoluted uh, process, but uh, yeah, the result is that you have this data structure that again, I'm saving it so I can don't have to do it next time. I'm saving it here. Uh, as a QS, so I can just, if it's already there for this particular annotation file, I can just load it and use it for all the notation of further uh, junction sets and stuff like that. That was just showing uh, a good habit in, for this kind of uh, complex processing. 
Now, to get the exonic length of genes, it should be a similar uh, method. But in this case, we have to take into account that exons for a gene, they can overlap. So, and what we want when we, when we think about the, what's the effective exonic length of a gene is uh, you, you have to, whatever is not, is covered by any of the exons in that gene, which in this case, um, in order to do that, uh, you have to merge all the overlapping exons in the larger interval that's, uh, you know, that in the larger set, in the set of intervals that are only non-overlapping uh, exonic ranges. So there's a function that's called reduce here. It's also in the, I think in base R, but it's specialized in this case on genomic ranges um, to take the output of, uh, to take the genomic uh, ranges, G, G ranges list, which in this, in this case is the exon uh, group, exons group by transcript ID that I created earlier. And you can apply this reduce, reduce function, which is, which is gonna merge all the overlapping exon within, within each, uh, in this case, I split them by gene ID. So in, within each gene, it's gonna merge all the overlapping exons. So again, uh, it's, this is, yeah, we can, yeah, this is documented probably better in the, yeah, in the, even though it was hard for me to, to find this kind of recipes, but they are described in the vignette, I think, for the genomic ranges. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what we actually have to do in order to, to get the length column in the, the arranged summarized experiment experiments exactly for, for the purpose of normalization uh, for the row ranges in the RSC experiments, right? We have to create this length column exactly like I'm creating it here in order to get this uh, to effective exonic gene length. So yeah, I'm preparing this uh, gene uh, annotated uh, gene ranges object and annotation gene here. Which has the length column added exactly for again for purposes of normalization later and, and later or other other situations like that. Um, now for junctions, I don't know how. Yeah, it's a, a complicated. If I want to annotate novel junctions, I have the here a short example. Uh, and I execute this code? I want to make sure that I, I keep up. For junctions, I have a small with 40,000 junctions sampled from a, a randomly, right, from a, um, our existing uh, RSC, RSC uh, with junctions um, from our, on our, on our, our data sets. And of course, most of them we see are actually novel, uh, not really matching the reference junctions. So here I just removed, they already annotated because as I mentioned, speakeasy pipeline, annotates uh, junctions, novel junctions, tries to <laughs> list uh, some of them. And uh, and I here I wanted to start with a clean slate from that RSA JX uh, subset. So I nulled uh, the metadata and the uh, names. The names are actually like we see here in this uh, output. They are, uh, we use sometimes names like this. This is 40,000. A junction introns found in uh, in this sample here that I loaded, and it shows this. Uh, yeah, right now they are uh, not annotated, and I just assign name to be this string, which is similar to what we use to to name our objects. It's it's it, naming uh, like that is actually an easy way to 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 check instantly for uh, for. Uh, a match in the in an intron, a full intron match, right? Because the name is based on the actual location and strand. So sometimes just a string uh, hash like that, it's easier than uh, an interval, an exact interval match. So to annotate junctions, I realized there's so much code to show that I only uh, wrote the beginning of it when we start to assign those things that we see uh, that if they are in gen code, if they are in, uh, I mean, fully matching reference annotation, or if only one end, like a start, matches 
start the coordinate for an intron in the in the reference annotation. So this again, part of this code is uh, can be found in in the Spikizi uh, R code for for uh, for building the RSE. Uh, and but I I had to change it in quite a few ways because the, the I wanted to keep track of all uh, lists of genes and lists of transcripts instead of only one transcript or gene on only one gene symbol that uh, I think the coding there was was doing. So uh, in my in my case, I, I started to to even uh, use you know more complex code to to get this uh, to try to get this annotation working on on composite uh, list on list columns, which are kind of sometimes tricky to handle in uh, in R. Uh, in this case, actually, I flatten them because since they are sorted, I can usually check if they are two, like two lists are identical um, by just checking the, the string match. But uh, yeah, the annotation here, the end, ending annotation is going to be like a flattened list, like in this case, uh, we see this is actually a list of transcripts sharing this um, this known. This is an in-gen, which means in-gen code. It's a, it's annotated as being already uh, present in in reference and the reference annotation gen code. So uh, yeah, and code like this, <laughs> uh, it just takes the junction annotation that I reference junction or introns the G ranges that I prepared earlier. And uses it as uh, to annotate these some of these so-called novel junctions. Some of them, I mean, they are yeah. Some of them are novel at this stage, but this is a progressive uh, annotation. So it's it uh, looks for you know, various situations when you just uh, the start is matched, the start coordinate or the end coordinate is is matching the known uh, intron start coordinate or end coordinate. So yeah, this we we can do this kind of. Uh, classification of junctions that's happening in the, when, when we build this RSC in order to annotate uh, large uh, date sets of uh, junctions. So now uh, it's important to, uh, to realize that this sample of 40,000 is, is nothing uh, compared to what we usually get from a data set with hundreds of samples. We currently get uh, over, uh, over around 2 million or 2, two million uh, junctions which is uh, way more than, than, uh, than what we see, for example, the number of introns in, a, in the, in the uh, reference annotation. So I think, yeah, length of, you see, um, I think, uh, the, let's see how many actually are there. In the, this is a reference annotation introns. So, wow, it's actually much more than even I remember. So yeah, the number of junctions, the introns, known introns in reference data is only about 400,000. But what we get out of, uh, of our uh, SPQZ pipeline during, because of um, I said two alignments, we get uh, like uh, around 2 million for, for a few hundred uh, RNA seq samples when we merge all this uh, junction data, we get uh, a large matrix of 2 million by a few hundred samples, which is a huge matrix to keep uh, to keep around. So of course, we use uh, usually uh, lately, especially uh, sparse matrix representation for, for the expression data. Yeah, here for these 40,000 samples, as I showed earlier, the code was only found um, only found like uh, this to, to, to 2700 uh, junctions that actually fully match start and uh, the intron, the reference introns. Uh, well, for that, uh, again, code uh, actually is much com more complex than <laughs> this because you had to take into account uh, situations like finding fusions between when a, a gene when the two ends of an intron of a novel intron are in different uh, genes, for example, which is what we call a fusion a junction, fusion intron, it connects two separate genes and it doesn't happen in the uh, reference annotation, of course, but uh, 
this is a this is something that we want to report. So the annotation of these junctions get, can get very complex, especially when you have to handle list of genes, uh, list of uh, the transcripts and, and, and stuff like that for each end of an intro of an intro. Now a simpler situation here is when we have a novel transcript. I created one G ranges uh, object out on the fly, considering uh, to be unknown. Of course, I actually took some introns uh, exons from a known gene for this example, and this is a simplest example of showing uh, how find overlaps uh, works. So uh, yeah, if I just if I create this G ranges object and I search against all the uh, other G ranges that I prepared for all the transcripts, we get uh, I, actually it's yeah for all the transcripts, but I think that the, uh, I find the overlaps for maybe two ways. I'm showing that you can use the uh, the hits uh, at exon level, or if you actually use find overlaps function on on G ranges list objects, uh, you you get uh, which I did here. I created a dummy uh, G ranges list with just this uh, with just this transcript for just this transcript with all the uh, with all the exons grouped. So this is a simple G ranges list object with a single entry, which is a my unknown transcript with uh, these um, three axons that I define. And I, I found the overlaps. Uh, again, it's good to search, find the overlaps between two G, G ranges list objects. So it has to be either two G, G ranges objects or two G ranges list objects. So uh, in this case, it shows that it's it's much more compact and uh, to to use the higher level because the h the output of the hits the hits uh, object is going to be more compact. It's going to show uh, for each. Of course, we only have one query, uh, each which is our unknown transcript G ranges list uh, with only one element, and uh, some of the hits are all the genes. Uh, Actually, all the G ranges list from annotation, all the transcripts <laughs> that have overlaps, any kind of exon overlap. So this find overlaps goes down to the exons right in each of the G ranges list, and uh, reports this at uh, the up the higher level, the transcript level in this case. So this is the index of the transcript in the G ranges list, uh, and these are the indices of the of the matching founds have some exon overlaps in uh, the reference annotation transcripts grouped by at least. It's indeed, it's hard to, it's to follow, I realize that. Uh, and anyway, the, the output is, you can use this, this very, in a silly way, maybe that just to annotate. I think I, I executed that, but let's see the output again. So just to annotate um, with these genes, uh, I, I collected these genes in a list because you can hit multiple genes, right? When you have an unknown. Uh, so in this case, I uh, I used unique, right? To, to, because some of these names could be duplicated from the from the from the transcript that it uh, overlapped. So by collapsing the list to unique entries, and in this case, I only got one gene, which is SNX19. But an interesting feature here is that you can actually add uh, metadata at at uh, G, G ranges list level, which is uh, kind of I couldn't find this very useful because this object uh, has only essentially a, a name of the of the it's an element list element right so. Uh, when you use uh, metadata to associate to a, to a transcript ID here in this uh, object, you only have uh, just this, you don't have a genomic range associated at that level directly. The genome, the actual G ranges are, are in the list of G ranges that you are grouping 
which is the axons in this case. So I, I didn't find it very interesting to put the metadata at the, at higher level for the G ranges list. Even though it is a possibility, I'm not sure how exactly how I would use that. I mean, you can see, I can add it actually here. I'm showing that maybe it's better to, to add this for each axon for that unknown transcript, because that's how they are grouped anyway. Uh, so if you do this, you assign, so to this monkey X, transcript, the G range is for this transcript. Now they have the, the genes assigned as a metadata column based on this overlaps, which again could be assigned at, as I did here at the gene G ranges list level, but uh, it doesn't seem to be very useful since the G ranges are here. Um, I don't know, I guess uh, it's getting, I'm not sure if, yeah, that was an, uh, maybe a quick example would be to use uh, how to write uh, faster sequences based on these ranges of interest. So in this case, I show how you can write uh, the intergenic sequences. So in order to get the intergenic sequences was also, I used the same trick as used earlier to find uh, the introns, where I merge the gene ranges, overlapping gene ranges by using the uh, reduce, Use the reduce here, right? I use the reduce after I uh, to to merge overlapping gene ranges and then sub subtracting uh, the these these G ranges with overlapping gene ranges um, from the whole chromosome. So that's how, of course, you get the similar manner with uh, that uh, was used to get the intron uh, G ranges earlier, right? Uh, subtracting exons from Exon G ranges from the whole length of a whole span of a transcript. So the same trick is used here to to prepare the this G ranges uh, object again using P set diff to do the subtraction right of these intervals. Um, and here I show how you co can work with the R R some tools. Uh, to, to extract these G ranges from the genome. Uh, so our sum tools has these powerful functions based on you know, some tools uh, library, HTC, uh, to open an indexed genome. In this case, it's an indexed compressed uh, genome. I didn't even need to, to unpack it, but the index applies to the, to the compressed chunks in there, like, uh, so in this case, we can directly pull from the compressed uh, genome uh, very quickly, very efficiently, these uh, this ranges using this function, right? String. Well, actually, the getseek is the function from our sum tools uh, package. So again, there are other data structures going into DNA strings, these bio strings. Uh, it's, it, it's interesting to read about them. Uh, they are quite uh, complex, but uh, but very helpful in this case to, to do the operations like this. So this probably takes a little bit. The problem is uh, when you have this, anything that's loop, looping in scripting languages, as you know, and that is one of them, when you have also or any kind of loop, it tends to go uh, quite slow. Um, but in this case, uh, these are functions optimized to work on on DNA string sets, which is what I'm getting here from the get seek functions. So I get in a very quickly from the FASTA sequence of the genome, from the sequence of the genome, actually, this is a reader uh, and uh, I get all the, in this case, just for chromosome se uh, seven, I get all the intergenic ranges for chromosome seven in, in one simple instruction and then uh, you know, call, function call, and then you can also, write this uh, DNA string set that's resulting here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this is the object that's written by get six. The get six so it takes into takes as a second parameter uh, this G ranges object. So whatever G ranges you have there from the genomic sequence, it's gonna create these strings out of it, uh, DNA string set. So I guess they really look very nice in the sense that they even have modified the show function to color by nucleotide. I don't know. I think Hervé Paget uh, is the author of 
I think that the attention to details here is, is remarkable. Uh, and you can see that usually for the chromosome, many of the, our chromosomes, they are, uh, I mean, some of them, I guess, they have a lot of ends at the beginning and the end because they know the scaffold length, but sometimes they don't get the, they didn't assemble the beginning of the ending. So you see this, uh, yeah, gene uh, ends at the end. And this can, this, uh, this is gonna be assembled and put in, in a file. Uh, yeah, I have the file here. This is written by this. So we can look on the file. I guess it's, uh, yeah, it's getting late. I realized I went over time a bit. So I guess we can stop here for the...